It's wonderful to see you here this morning. We're so glad to have you here. Um, we have been focusing a lot on uh, sharing the gospel with people. And uh, this morning is really about the return and how we want to live our lives. But I, I want to keep ever before you, keep talking about your Savior and your church and your God in front of your neighbors and your friends and your colleagues at work. We desperately want to grow this church. We want to grow this family. There are so many lonely, hurting people out there, and they need to belong. And what better place to belong than in this church? Amen? Amen. Well, Stephen Covey, a well-known life church, motivational speaker, writer, and efficiency guru, says in life, always begin with the end in mind. And that's so true. He says, if you want to succeed in something, try to figure out what that something is before you start. Otherwise, you'll find your ladder to your dreams leaning on the wrong hope. Covey is quoted as saying, if your ladder is leaning against the rock, the, if your ladder is not leaning against the right wall, every step you take gets you to the wrong place faster. And I couldn't agree more. What is it that you want out of life? What end do you have in mind, church? What end are you racing to? Two, the subject of doing life, living well, having life, and having life to the full is one of the most important things that I think that we can focus on. Unfortunately, many have made it the goal of life about all the wrong things. Some see their goal in life as being popular, having prestige. Acquiring wealth. In America, we seem to be very focused on possessing the perfect home, having the ultimate job, but all these things will fade, and in the end, they will not really matter. Popularity is kind of like the wind. One day you're in everyone's mouth, and the next you're totally forgotten. Does anybody remember who Charles P. Conrad is? Me neither. He was the third guy to step on the moon. There's only been 12. That's pretty impressive. And you don't recall his name. How about, we've got some medical people in here. How many people remember who Alex Fleming is? One, two, two people? Yeah, he's not very important. He just discovered and perfected penicillin, probably the greatest single gift of modern medicine. How about uh, Francis Bacon? Do you remember him? I've got one that remembers him. No, Jordan, it's not the guy who perfected your favorite cut of, ham, or of, of pig. It's not Bacon. Francis Bacon, he's an architect of the modern-day science method. He literally changed the scientific method. He literally changed the way science is thought about. And he had a huge impact, strangely, on religion also. How about Eli Whitney? Where's Preston? Oh, there's a few in the room who know Eli. Very good. If you're wearing this morning, if you're wearing a cotton blend of some type, he has impacted your life. He came up with the modern-day cotton gin. Most of these people were wildly popular in their day, but are almost forgotten today. What's the end game? Is it to be popular? How about prestige? Prestige is really a concept that often changes with every generation. Do you remember, for those of you who are like me, advanced in years, do you remember we used to celebrate Columbus Day? He was sold to us as a hero. Now he's thought more of an enslaver or murderer. 
in his journal written between August 3rd, 1492 and November of the same year, he wrote, speaking of the natives, they, are willingly, they willingly trade for everything they own, meaning they're easy to take advantage of financially. They're well built with good bodies and handsome features. They do not bear arms and do not know them. For I showed them a sword and they took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They have no iron, meaning they have no way to defend themselves. They would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. And within a year, he subjugated thousands of indigenous people and sent 500 slaves that year back to Queen Isabel. In less than five years, a city of 250,000 indigenous people had been reduced to a few hundred by Columbus and his brothers. You see, prestige is, again, just a concept that's easily twisted and distorted. In the end, what does prestige really gain you? And wealth. Wealth can be obtained, but has very little to do with happiness or joy or quality of life. Do a deep study of the wealthiest people in the world, and you'll find some of the most depressed, sad, and lonely people that there are. I knew a guy... I guess I still know him, who had inherited here in Fayetteville hundreds of thousands, excuse me, hundreds of millions of dollars. And he was one of the loneliest guys I had ever met in my life. And he spent most of his time avoiding people because, Rick, he never knew if people wanted to get to know him or wanted to get at his money. Just a few years back, I was at a little church out in the Boston mountains called Black Oak, deep in the woods. And there, as I walked in the back of the church, he sat on the back row. It was the only place that no one knew him for his wealth, and he knew if people were being, being kind to him there, at least they were being sincere. I've never seen a correlation between wealth and joy, church. Why would wealth be our end game? The ultimate job. I'm not sure what that is for you. The best I think we can do is find an area, something in our lives that we really love and try to make a living at it. Because the truth is, someday, you'll probably get bored with it. Or you'll get old and some younger, smarter person will come along and take your job for half the pay. Can I get an amen? Or you'll reach the top of your career path and then learn the top is not all it's cracked up to be. Often the top is lonely, stress-filled, and empty. Matter of fact, if you look at most of the CEOs in the Fortune 500 businesses, they really don't have a life. They just work. So what's your end game? What should you be living for? Jesus tells us, do not lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, or excuse me, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth or rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. There neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Just before this, Jesus tells his followers to pray to God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, meaning bring the ways of heaven to earth. Our goal, our purpose cannot be about power and prestige and popularity. If that's our end game, we lose it all, literally. You'll lose it all in the end. Church, you've never seen a U-Haul following a hearst. So what treasure expands the kingdom of God? What treasures can be built up that you can't rust, that won't degrade, and people can't steal away from you? And a word, church, it's relationships. The relationships you build here and now are the only thing that transcends life into the next the relationship with God, and the relationship with others. 
If we're going to begin to live with the end in mind, then the end game should be that one day we hear our Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I don't get so excited about being over a whole bunch of things, but entering into the joy of the Lord really excites me. Because let's be honest, the most terrifying, the most frightening thing that can happen for us is on that day when the Lord returns for him to say, depart from me, I never knew you. For the Lord to say, you wicked and lazy servant, angels cast this unprofitable servant into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I, I tell you, church, I'm not big on scare tactics. I think fear is a poor motivator. But we cannot escape the words of Paul in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10, where he says, God will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who do not know God and those who refuse to obey God's good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power when he comes on that day. Church, live with the end in mind. Every moment you live, live with the end of this life. Live for the moment that you'll see Christ face to face. Live with the understanding that when your heart stops beating, the only thing that will matter to you are relationships. I've done two funerals in two weeks, and nothing mattered to the families except relationships. No one talked about power and prestige and popularity in the families. What talked about was relationships, fellowships, memories shared, and love extended. When Dawn and Francis met Jesus, nothing mattered except their relationship with Jesus and the relationship that they had built with others. Parents, when I was in the YMCA, a director in Pensacola, I can't tell you how many times parents focused on and told me that they worked long hours and picked their children up late because they wanted their children to have everything they didn't. And I always tried to remind them, they will never remember the designer clothing that you buy them. They will forget the money that you poured into their first car. They will take the house that you raised them in for granted. They will not talk about how your countertops are granite and your driveways are paved and the two cars in the garage. What they will remember are the days that you played with them in the backyard, the days that you showed them integrity in your life, the kindness you showed them and others, the dinners where you laughed at the table until milk came out somebody's nose. They'll remember when you prayed for the sick and the hurting. They'll remember when you thanked God for them just being your child. They'll remember when you showed hospitality and did kind things to others. They'll remember the allegiance and the loyalty that you showed to Christ throughout your life. Church, we need to remember how we treat others builds relationship with those you love. I was only eight, nine years old when I remember being at Mr. Burger and my father got up and ordered two extra cheeseburgers with fries. He had seen two boys over in the corner sitting with an older gentleman, mouths watering as they watched him eat and they had none. And he just got up and ordered two cheeseburgers and walked over and handed to them. I can remember a couple of boys coming on the church bus. You remember the joy buses that we used to drive all over Fayetteville? Two boys coming 
and their feet, their shoes in such bad shape that their toes were literally coming out the tops because their feet were growing and the shoes were not. And dad putting them in the car, taking them to Walmart and say, boys, you pick out any tennis shoe you want and I'll buy it for you. I remember the hugs from my mother that would snap the spine of an elephant if you weren't ready. How you treat others builds relationships, church, for eternity. Church, nothing matters but relationships. And the only real end game that matters at all is that Jesus tells you on that day, enter into my kingdom, you good and faithful servant. All that really matters is who you are going to spend eternity with. Will it be your Lord and those you love? Church, build relationships that are built on the words of Jesus Christ. They're the only thing that will transcend this life into the next life. What do you hope for? What do you hope for, church? What is what is that thing that you live for? What are you living for this morning? I wish I could remember. Did you ever read something and then you forgot where you read it and you can't find it again? I read this story a few years back. I think it was before I even started preaching. And I've never forgotten it. And it's just a metaphor for life. If you run across it after I tell it to you, you remember who wrote it or, or where it's written, I, I wish you would remind me. I'd like to give the author credit to it. Otherwise, it's mine. I thought it all up. <laughs> it's a story of two sons. They lived near the beach. The father took them to the beach and said, boys, I'll be back at the end of the day. You just stay here and enjoy the sand and the sun. I know you love to build your sand castles. And the two boys did. They loved playing in the sand and building sand castles. And so as soon as their father left, they started digging moats. And then inside the moat, they started building their walls, Jack, and building the little spires on the end. And then they, they started to build the castle in the middle. And they took their little pails and, and started the four corners and they took their little sand trials and, and dug out the little windows and the, and the little doors and, and, and they, they made a very elaborate wall around it, filled the moat with water. Of course, we know how that goes. It empties out over and over again. You just keep having to fill it. They went up into the reeds and, and got a few pieces of reeds and made little drawbridges to go across the moat. And then... Then the sun began to set, and they knew the Father was coming, and they knew the tide was rolling in. And one little boy turned, and he saw the tide coming in, and it splashed a little against his wall, and he began to yell at the tide. And about that time, the Father came up, and he said, boys, it's time to go home. And he put his hands out, and one little boy ran to his daddy's hand and took it, and they began to walk home. And the other laid himself down between the tide of time and screamed at the tide as it started to wash his little empire away, screaming and crying and kicking. Well, you know what happened. In the end, tide comes in and washes all little sandcastles and empires away. Church, when life's sun sets, take the Father's hand and go home. We're not living for the little empire. We're living for the day that the Father takes us home. Amen? Play, church. 
Pray, church. Persevere. And when life's sun sets, take the Father's hand and go home. Let's pray. God, help us to live for your son's return. Help us to love like he loved, to show kindness and mercy. Help us to practice justice to all and to live lives that are loyal to you and your kingdom. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power of the work within us and to him be the glory to the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.